What's up, everybody? It's Todd B. from Tennessee, and I'm here today with the guys from Omega Pictures, here to talk about film, creativity, uh, what it takes to really put together a good movie, and God knows what else. So I'll get started. It's not every day that I have a chance to uh, interview a whole crew at one time. So basically what's going to happen, guys, I'm going to go from left to right on my screen. So start with Kevin and go to the right. I'll give you a brief bio of each person. Then you guys tell me what movie you've watched most recently, and then we'll move to the next one. So first up, we have Kevin Jurgen, a guy with a master's degree in film. He studied film and pop culture, poetry and ancient culture. Um, Kevin, you're a dad, which means you bring a different perspective to the table than a lot of us young guys. So go ahead and tell everybody, what movie have you been watching most recently, and how has fatherhood impacted uh, kind of what you do creatively? Give me a good perspective on uh, sort of uh, movies, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I guess fatherhood, I actually just asked my buddy Hunter here to borrow Harry Potter, the first movie for the first time to show my son tomorrow. Uh, he's five years old. So it, it's kind of cool to, I guess, uh, experience movies for the first time with him in that way. Uh, one movie we're not going to experience together that I watched recently is Children of Men. Uh, Screen that for my film class. It's a great movie, though. Excellent movie. I forgot how depressing it was. Um, yeah, this is Monday, and I was screening it for my film class, and I, I should have warned them, guys. This is gonna, this is gonna make you kind of question your life. <laughs> forgot that warning, uh, but watched it. Wonderful discussion about it too. Uh, probably one of my top ten movies of all time, I would say. Whoa. Yeah, it's it's up there now. No kidding. No kidding. Well, I mean, I guess anytime you watch a depressing movie on a Monday, you should know that it's it's going to be worse than any other day, right? <laughs> at, at least you're hitting your low point early, right? Right, so that's all, right. Yeah. All uphill from there. Um, and in the center here, we have Hunter Perschbacher, uh, kind of the founder of Omega Pictures. Not kind of. He is the founder of Omega Pictures, and you guys have a great uh, project going on. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but Hunter, go ahead and introduce yourself. And what have you been watching most recently? Uh, well, yes, I'm Hunter Perschbacher, and I think it will come as no surprise to anyone here to know that the most recent movie I've watched is one of the Star Wars films. <laughs> it might surprise people to know that that Star Wars film was legitimately, in all honesty, uh, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. was the, the movie I most recently watched. Okay. <laughs> really? <What? laughs> I mean, I, I was just thinking, because I didn't know you were going to ask that. I was thinking, what is it? Oh, no, it was. It was <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Amazing. And then on the far right here, we have Garrett Delosier, uh, editor and animator. Uh, Garrett's done a lot of cool stuff, projects with Kidney Chesney, uh, one of the ESPN films, work with HDTV, Old Dominion, a, a whole bunch of neat stuff. So I'll let him reflect on that for a second and then tell us what you have been watching most recently. Uh, yeah, worked on um, worked on a feature length documentary about Coach Steve Spurrier. Um, that might be a, a kind of not a great name to hear when you're in Tennessee because he used to coach for the Florida Gators. Especially and, this weekend. Yeah, that game is happening <laughs> tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but we worked on a feature length documentary about the life um, and trials of his whole sports career. Uh, co produced by Kenny Chesney, worked on some music videos. Um, Old Dominion music videos, um, save, uh, Song for Another Time just hit a few months ago. Check that music video out. I'm really proud of that one. Nice. Uh, nice. Worked with uh, Steve Condon and the group at the 1010 Creative. Uh, That's um, the one with the DeLorean in it. The, no, no, no. The one with the, the DeLorean in it is um, uh, Break Up With Him. Oh, right, I did, right. I did the sorry. graphics for, for that. Oh, yeah. the most recent one is that crazy one with all the... Graphics yeah, like, yes, do watch that. It'll <laughs> melt your face off. That's all Garrett. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what if you been, that's so, like, okay, so for everybody watching, Garrett and I kind of go back a, a little bit, and I, I am not surprised. I don't think anyone here is surprised that he kind of went, uh, and then we're coming back now. So what's, what's the most recent thing that you have watched or are watching? Right, so... Two nights ago, I was up late, uh, my mind wandering with various uh, stresses. I wanted to wind down with a good old, dumb Jackie Chan action movie. Of course. And uh, 
and I wanted to watch one that I hadn't seen before. And it was something called The Chinese Zodiac. It came out like a year or two years ago, directed by Jackie Chan. And I only lasted about 15 minutes. <laughs> um, it started with an amazing premise. Jackie Chan, again, he does like all his own stunts. And it's him, it's him racing down this mountain away from bad guys in a whole suit covered in rollerblade wheels, head to toe. So he's like on, just like flat on the road, <laughs> going under trucks. And, and I'm like, what an amazing idea. Yeah. Executed terribly. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> just like, uh, oh. And it's like, no, pull back, Jackie. You're actually doing these amazing feats. Like, pull back and let's see you do these amazing things. But I don't recommend Chinese Zodiac. Does it get better after 20 minutes in? I'll never know. <laughs> who, who can say? Right. right. But that I, was the last thing I watched. I figured that out halfway in. I was like, wait, I just saw his tweet about that. So I, <laughs> I knew what was coming. That's amazing. Um, so I, I wanted to get in, and, and for everybody watching, we're going to get into a little bit of the, the creative process, right? And I know there are going to be a lot of filmmakers watching this and potential filmmakers, so we'll get into that a little bit. But Hunter – I warned you this was coming. Uh, this is, I think, going to be of interest to, to everyone who kind of looks in because you are a fan of the first three Star Wars movies in a world, in a culture where most people are not. So it would take a few seconds, uh, and people can rage in the comments later or whatever, to defend your stance, please, on the first three Star Wars movies. Um. I'm not, I'm not so much going to defend it, but tell you what I like about them. <laughs> and what I like is uh, what I learned from them. And what I learned is, like, how to tell a story visually and with pure cinematic language. Um, I think with, how do I say this, the prequels, um, there are a lot of, let's say, superficial flaws that I see, everybody sees. But, man, all of that does not matter one bit to me once I start looking at what Lucas put into those uh, films on a visual level only. And the stories and characterizations he was giving, just with visual cues and even, uh, you know, sound cues, but mostly, and Lucas said this, Lucas, because we're friends, George Lucas Look, and I. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Said, You're on a last name basis with him? <laughs> George. I'll just say George, because I'm on a first name. <laughs> um, George Lucas has said on a number of occasions that the Star Wars films can work as silent movies. And I think that's something I latched onto in film school was learning that really on the visual level, the cinematography level, you need to build your story up on a visual level so that I'm saying level a lot um, so that you could turn the sound off and you could watch it and you could get maybe not the exact story as far as expo uh, exposition, but uh, what the film is emoting and the emotional story, the thematic story and then the symbolic. And that's something Lucas does uh, just with a with an intense mastery with the prequel films, and so there's some silly stuff, sure, but there's some silly stuff in the original trilogy as well, and I love all of them, all well, of the six of them. Um, <laughs> well, okay, so, wait a minute, that's where I was gonna go next. Okay, so we recently had a Star Wars movie come out, um, mixed emotions, I assume, right? Mixed? No, no, no. <laughs> Um, I will tell you, The Force Awakens did disappoint me a great deal because I was looking for the myth that Lucas injected into his films and even the films he didn't direct but was, was such a huge force behind, like Empire, such a mythical movie. Right. Um, and I was looking for that kind of thing because Star Wars to me is fantasy before sci-fi or action or any of that. Um, the Force Awakens, I thought, didn't have that, what I was looking for, but... Before anyone gets mad, I will say that I bought The Force Awakens and I've seen it four whole times. Whoa! And I'm trying. I'm trying to like it because Star Wars is uh, easily my favorite thing in the entire world. So I don't want to. I, want, I don't want to be left out right. of one of the episodes. Um, but I, I, I definitely was. Well, you've made me find a, a greater appreciation for the prequels cool. in just talking to you and being your friend. Um, and you, interestingly, you were telling me the other day you were watching uh, Revenge of the Sith mm. and how. Um, it's, it's the opening scene where Anakin is with, he's about to duel against Count Dooku. And it's Dooku. like after. Well, it's the whole scene, right? Yeah, at the beginning of the movie. Mm. And watching what's actually going on behind him, the big space battle. That is it actually telling Anakin's story. Telling, telling Anakin yeah. and Palpatine's story in the way the space battle moves. In this sort of symphonic and really direct way that Lucas uh, choreographed the lasers and the ships going behind. And so you... 
about the prequel specifically, what I like is I can notice something like that and think, oh my gosh, what an idea and what, 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 what an idea to further uncover. And I can come back to the film uh, and try to study it more and I'll find something else along those same lines. And so it could be me reading into it, me having studied Lucas as I do and, and have. Uh, I know that it's not just me looking into it. Uh, it's, it's me finding little treasures that he's put in there that I, as that a filmmaker, yeah, and, and that I'm really, really, really into as yeah. a filmmaker myself. Yeah, definitely. So, so you think, maybe not to put too fine a point of it, but George Lucas himself is the difference between the six Star Wars movies and then the newest one. Do you, do you feel him missing from this most recent interview? I do, because now it's, it's a filtration, right? It's, it's people taking in his ideas, filtering them out, and then sending them out, which is great. Um, Lucas was the originator of those ideas, though. So you're having your it's the you're going through a filtration process versus going right to the spring itself, the, the wellspring itself. Um, but I don't think that The Force Awakens is a bad movie or anything. It's just not it didn't feel as though it was the Star Wars that I was looking for and the Star Wars that Lucas had um, built up to that point. Um, so it's different and it's taken me a lot a long time to wrestle with it. But I'm <laughs> I won't say I'm coming around, but I have found things in the film that I that I do enjoy. Right. 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 <laughs> Understand. Even even if you have to try a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, and that's what the prequels. The prequels make force a viewer to really try. Um they're not as accessible as A New Hope was. You yeah. know, you can't just sit there and let the the poppy sensations wash over you and have a religious experience. You have to dig and be challenged a little bit more. Right. Um which right. is a huge turnoff for people. Um but for me, it's like I get super excited about that, and I want I want to continue to mine it. So, yeah, yeah, understood. And Kevin, I'm going to go over to you now because you're the writer of Day Seven, this film that you guys have in production, and and you're raising for him. <laughs> what are you shaking? Oh, you guys both? Yeah, co co written. I'd say. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't know. <laughs> okay. All right, that's that. Yeah. E- either way, I I know. Um, yeah. Sharing credit. I know you guys are, are all in this together for sure. But, but Kevin, I want to go to you specifically, actually, because of some of the thoughts that you had um, from that story perspective on you guys' podcast about Star Wars, right? So I, I'm curious, maybe, it, and I'm going to try to transition us out of Star Wars a little bit and talk about film in general, right? But I'm, I'm curious as to what makes a good story in a movie and and maybe you can take some elements from star wars out of there and then just kind of give us some more general thoughts on on what a script writer should really be trying to do uh, i guess what what appeals uh, most to me in movies like that especially in star wars and really anything i guess uh is just a character's journey um uh, it doesn't take much time uh, in a movie to show us a character arc and a really solid one i guess using uh it, sticking with Star Wars, Lando Calrissian and Empire Strikes Back is my favorite uh, above all. I mean, we see so many different angles um, from that character. We see him deceiving the main characters. We see him betraying them finally. Uh, we also see him you know, uh, coming to their aid eventually at the, at the very end of his arc. Um, that all happens in about 20 or 30 minutes. I mean, he's not on screen very much at all. Um, but I always love, even if it's a completely crappy movie, if I see a character go through that kind of stuff, uh, I'm just always impressed. I always like seeing just different angles happening with a single character. Um, so I'd say that so that's what appeals most to me. Um, so even if it is not a great story or there's problems with the production values in a movie or things like that, if I see a character going through that kind of arc, I really enjoy that as a viewer, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, and I think it's, it's interesting, the point you made, that, that it doesn't take that much time. To kind of, in a movie to show how a character can really change and grow, and, and Lando is a perfect example there for sure. Um, and, and I'm going to move it over to Garrett, who you have a plenty of experience, you know, taking this massive amount of footage, right? As an editor, you you, you get a yeah. ton of stuff, right? And then you have to somehow cut that down and figure out a a narrative right within these shots i know we talked yesterday you're working on a, a documentary about guns in texas right is that right yeah yeah i don't know how much i'm at liberty to say about okay. the whole project quite yet um but yeah i mean i'm trying to think of another example um um yeah i guess, I guess documentaries in general yeah have probably have 
the most footage and the most things to sift through. It's not planned out scripted scenes like in most narratives, which editing narratives are, that's my favorite type of project to work on. Um, but with that, you have a shot list and you have a script and you have performances and takes and you know, you know, by the script ultimately where the story needs to go through the edit. Um, but with documentaries, it is multiple interviews. It's multiple places. It's, um, it's all the B roll to cover up the, what we call Franken bites. If somebody is saying a very long winded sentence <laughs> and saying a lot of ums and uh, and stumbling over their words, uh, what we'll try to do a lot of times, we'll, uh, cut out all those ums and things and make a coherent sentence. But now that fragments the picture. So we have to place right. B roll right. over top of it. Um, you watch any reality show, uh, that's happening all the time. If it cuts to something else other than talent, that's what's going on, guys. <laughs> the, uh, the talent can't speak. It's all up to the editors to really uh, pull that stuff out of, of regular, I guess, regular people on camera, especially people that um, aren't accustomed to being on camera, like people being interviewed for yeah, um, for documentaries and things like, like that. So it's a matter of just sifting through and finding what it is they're really saying and separating what's truly important, what's truly going to drive uh, this interview or this point in the documentary, separate it from everything else, hours of everything else that on its own could be interesting, could be an interesting bar story. You know, uh, you're with somebody and, oh, that, that's cool. Tell me about that story. But is it ultimately important for the overall project? No. So you got you to gotta scrap it. Um, it's just... They call it killing your baby over and over and over again, just taking everything and condensing it. Yeah, so, yeah, so what I heard what I, there is that later when I'm watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians and they show Kim on camera for two seconds and then cut away, she's really just rambling for half an hour and they're, they're cutting all that together. Are you telling me that's what happened? She's not as coherent as I think? <laughs> I'm sorry to say, Todd. Jeez. And I'm also sorry to hear that you're watching that show. <laughs> Uh, to, to be fair, um, it's been at least three days since I've since I've seen a Kardashian. So I, I want I want that out in the open so everyone knows where I am. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and you talk about shooting narrative, and and we'll move into kind of the, specifically the film world now. You guys have a script, right? And I think this is something that that always baffles me as um, a, a writer because I've got blog posts, and sometimes. I don't know where a story is going to go. And you guys get some of those things hammered out up front when you're writing the script. But I'm curious, whenever you move from script to, okay, now I have to convey this story to my actors who are really supposed to bring this to life, how on earth do you make that work? Anybody. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think just... Uh, clear, the clearest communication you can have, but also what I do, and I'm not saying this is, I don't know if this is the right way to do it or not, but I have a lot of information. It's like the way you're comfortable doing This it. is the way I'm comfortable doing it. Secondary and tertiary even information that I'm giving actors and even crew that's like, especially for our films, which take place in a whole different world, it's like I have to give them just reams of information. And so in my mind, it's like getting everyone raised up to the same sort of playing field where we all have the same knowledge, then we can really start communicating on the same level. And before that, you know, I could be talking to Garrett about the ALU and all this made up mumbo jumbo, but he's not going to have any idea and can't connect with my direction unless he knows what those basic concepts are. So I, I would say just paring it down and, and getting everyone up to the same level first, and then you can kind of go forward. Interesting. Interesting. So, so it's really, it's really as the director, as the it's director, kind of your job to, job to bring this world in your head to life for everybody else, right? Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, and it's a huge challenge uh, because something that's so simple in my head that I, you know, explain to myself so simply, even to Kevin trying to get that idea to him to start working on and getting it, you know, in the story or, or, or even finding its merit before we even get it in the story, that's even a challenge. So then taking that. And then we add, start adding all of these extra layers and specificality to it. Well, then it's far, that one idea has become so much more complicated. And then I take it to Garrett and I take it to whoever else. And so that's one idea. Um, so, yeah, I think just information. That's the main thing. Um, and it's also probably the hardest thing is just getting everyone up so we can go. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I definitely can see that because, you know, it's, I read something the other day about how difficult it must be to make a movie because you have your writers who generally have a big ego and then they hire a director or you get a director who generally has a big ego and then you have some actors who generally has a big ego. And I want to talk specifically about, because I know this is a, a kind of a creative struggle from photography to writing to art to film a lot of us feel like I think kind of lone wolf personalities and especially in movies and, and making a production like you guys are making. Um, how do you kind of, I don't know, break, break down that barrier. Is that just like a maturing thing or how do you get to the point where you're able to, to share what you're trying to do with other people? I think it's a matter of finding those other people that, want to achieve that common goal of creating good art um, together because I think part of maturing, yeah, you have to admit, like uh, me, I I think I'm pretty good at, at editing, but I, I don't want to touch a camera for the rest of my life. I would rather never hold a camera. I don't like to shoot. I'm not a great director of photography like our good friend uh, Derek Oxford, you know, so I think, and we all met like in film school and quickly discovered that, oh, you're great at this, you're, I'm great at this, you're great at this, and creating that team to, to build something that we can all be proud of together, and the second you start letting, letting ego get in the way of that will be a detriment to the project. I think so, too, but I think it's also <clears throat> so easy, and I think that's the first battle you have to face as an artist is your own ego. Yeah. You have to get to that spot where you go, I don't know, this isn't the best idea, because um, as a writer-director, for many years, it was just, okay, it's my ideas. It's my, you know, we have to just steamroll to get those ideas forward. And it took a lot of maturity and, and a lot of education to prove to me how much I didn't know and how much I needed. Uh, what, just what you said, everyone that has those specialities so I can just let that room in my brain open up again. And so I think that, yeah, the ego has to go first yeah. and then you can start collaborating. Otherwise, it's going to be a train wreck. Yeah. I think one thing that's helped too is uh, that lone wolf mentality for me kind of came from like, a, I don't want to work with a-holes or I don't want to work with people <laughs> that I don't like or I'm not going to like, uh, but that's kind of something you kind of have to get over because you will work with people you don't like. Um, people have different kinds of personalities and ways of working that are not going to jive with how you work, um, but I think that's a skill that's worth working on mm -hmm. if you can uh, learn how to cope with that and at least, you know, cooperate with that those kinds of people that are not going to you're not going to like their style, maybe, but if you can get around that, uh, you can still kind of you know, figure out how they're going to be useful for your project and for the overall goal of the team as well. So that's what I would say as far as, you know, my biggest hurdle is working with people I don't like so much. I like you guys a lot. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'll do Kevin, but, you know, wait, thank you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I guess that's the main thing I would say is my contribution. Good, yeah. good work. Yeah. Good work. Yeah, yeah. I like I like that a lot. Um, specifically, I want to call out. Obviously, there's a lot there, but I want to call out what um, you guys, Hunter and, and Garrett, said. Just about I, what I heard was you're really aware of like the things that you don't want to do. You know, I think I think sometimes you know, and I I met with a friend recently who was making movies back in high school, and right, because he did it all. He was like, okay, I'm gonna shoot this, and I'm gonna like stand in the front of the camera and do some of the acting, and then I'm also gonna edit it later. And I think, and I want you guys to kind of weigh in on this. It's kind of being able to put down, okay, even though I can maybe am capable of doing everything, I'm not going to. Is that kind of what the mentality is there? Well, I think for me, uh, I think it depends, but for me, it's like, I think that stage is also really important that doing everything yourself because you at least get to know the trials and tribulations and have to sit your butt in that seat and edit and face those, those, uh, you know, individual choices that the editor's having to make that a director doesn't really have to make at that stage. When you're coming to see an assembly, you didn't have to make all those micro decisions, but having done it in the past, I know when Garrett has had to, and I can empathize in that way and understand those decisions. Um, but yeah, once you get out of that, uh, it is freeing in that way. And I've lost mm -hmm. my train of thought. I'll be honest with you. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think like your friend in high school, I mean, I was that guy. Like I, I think we were all similar where film is our thing and, you know, I'm going to lone wolf it and do everything and 
having done that, like I, you know, I know a little bit of the difficulties of say shooting or, you know, directing or, uh, acting if I have to. Um, but it's a matter of deciding, you know, and again, throwing ego away. It's like, what am I really good at? What am I good at? And how do I make this prod product the best product it can be? Um, get over yourself. <laughs> yeah. Just get over yourself. <laughs> That's that'll be the headline. Get over yourself, Garrett Delosier. That's. I, I, I do enjoy acting when I can, but uh, you know, if, if Hunter ever meets, you know, I don't know, Donald Gleason, you know, please by all means hire Donald Gleason over me. Dom no. Dom no. It's it's actually <laughs> Donald Gleason. Donald. It is yes. Wow. We've been calling him Dom Nog Gleason for ages. But I'm still gonna call him that. Yeah. Um. So so remind me in the audience, uh, which Weasley is he? Because is it is it yeah. Bill? Yeah. He's he's Mad Eye Moody Jr. Though, isn't he? Yeah, he's actually Mad Eye. Mad Eye's son in real life. Yeah. In real life, Brandon yeah. son. You're kidding. He's an ex Machina. How about mm-hmm. that ex Machina? He was in uh, About Time, is what I've seen. I'm trying to think of. Oh, he was in Star Wars Seven. Yeah, right? Star- yeah. yeah. He's the ginger in all those movies you're seeing. So. That's right. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, um, you care. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, before we get out of here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start wrapping it up. Give us a chance to for you guys to talk about what you're working on and, and dive into that world a little bit. But what always interests me about creative people, something I'm I'm kind of obsessed with figuring out, is where it all started. And so, and I'll stall and kind of talk a little bit here for you guys to get it settled in your mind. Maybe you know already, um, but most creatives have a moment or like a series of moments where they saw one movie or heard one song or like received a compliment about about some piece of their art and then it was like okay you know what like maybe i should be doing this so i'm curious what it is for each of you guys and i'm actually going to start on my right this time uh and go to garrett first uh put him on the clock so garrett what's that moment for you when you realize you you might be able to make art for your life um i think it may have been when i first saw the matrix um that came out in 99 i was in like the fifth or sixth grade um and uh i saw that and was blown away i love action films and i was already blown away by how technically amazing that movie was i hadn't seen anything like that but then my VHS tape at the end of it, yes, VHS, the Amazing. ancient technology, at the end of it, uh, the uh, the DVD extras were at the end of the VHS tape. And there was like some behind the scenes of like how they made, you know, the um, the gunfights and, and the wire work and, and, you know, what goes into this, what went into the special effects. And, and I was like completely blown away. It's like, that's somebody's job, like all these jobs people do this and and i was already interested in like performing i kind of liked acting but like that's really what opened my eyes to film making and i was like i i want to try to do this and my parents bought me a little handy cam and started just make my own bull crap in high school and middle school <laughs> <laughs> nice i i think i like uh, the piece of because I, I had a similar revelation where it was like oh people do this like this is a job i think for most of us kind of we go through um you know the school system and it's like okay you know doctor lawyer there really aren't unless you're in a school that's very well kind of funded for arts or you have a good art program so many of us are just unaware that this is even a career choice so that that really resonated with me um all right hunter talk to us um well, when I was small, young uh, child, I, I wrote a lot, like uh, short stories and things like that, because I, I thought movies was something someone else did, you know, that they just happened, you know. And so I thought, this is a, anybody can do this, just sit and write. And I also drew a lot and painted a lot. And uh, so I was kind of known for my art when I was younger. And then I just kind of, I don't know, went another path that seemed uh, not viable. And even though I had won a few, like, awards for painting and writing and stuff like that. Um, it wasn't until like high school, um, Kevin actually, uh, Kevin and I graduated high school together and we were in the same English class and we had to work on this senior project and he was doing it on production. And so I just piggybacked on that because I had shot a couple of things, but I just, I had this deep seated interest in 
getting those stories up on some other medium because uh, what writing just by itself lacks for me is that energy, that kinetic, just movement. You can't get that out of writing. And I need that. I need the camera to swing around. I need people to run. I need, I need costumes to catch the light. You know, I need all that. <laughs> And so I piggybacked on his, uh, pissed him right off, and then uh, kind of forced this friendship when we started making these stupid little videos <laughs> together, and then I just kind of went on from there. Wait, so you guys <laughs> weren't friends for a hot minute there. Is that what I heard? Uh, his senior year, that was your first year in Tennessee. Right, I had moved yeah. to Nashville my senior year, okay. and just was going to be friends with this one, <laughs> and was not going to be friends with this one. And... Um, I mean, it happened. Yeah, so, yeah. nice. look where we are. <laughs> you saw yeah. your vision to life. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, that that's good. I, I think for a lot of us, like it, it, it starts when we are young. You know, whether it's a, a doodle or for me, you know, I was scribbling stories down a, a lot like you and. I stuck to kind of the introverted side, and I, I think that's really interesting. That that what does it for you is not solely the story i guess but just different ways to tell the story kind of the different medium is that what kind of attracts you to film you think i think yes because even when i jot down a little idea or even a beat you know for a film i won't i i i, I won't feel connected to it until i'm able to see it like i just can't wait to get that little bit and see it in full motion and that's when i can be really excited and feel the power of that beat what's a beat that i've <laughs> You know, just a moment, just a moment, just what, you know, whatever that moment is that I've jotted down. Unless until I see it and I hear the score come up and I know what the camera's doing and I can just see it all working in, in concert. Until then, it's not worth it to me. <laughs> you make that all sound so very glamorous. I, I, I kind of I want to make this movie with you guys now because of that. <laughs> um, all right, Kevin, let's go ahead uh, and finish up. What, what was kind of your moment when you when you got into this film stuff? Probably uh, I got a editing program on my computer, like a really old, crappy editing program on an old, crappy computer. Uh, back in like the early 2000s, I think I was, still, I was in high school. Um, and I just learned how to pirate DVDs. Um, and I got this nice program that would pull the movie off, and I could put it on a burn DVD and just hand it out in high school, whatever. Um, uh, so Whoa. what it also let me do, though, is uh, there's like a little video editor embedded in that. So I could pull the video out and uh, put some like audio tracks underneath it. And I discovered I could make like music videos out of like Linkin Park songs. Yeah! And Underworld DVD <laughs> movies and just the crappiest goth stuff you can imagine. Wow. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that was really what I, what I enjoyed doing most. Hated high school for the longest time. So I just, when I, my joy back then was getting home, being on the computer and, uh, making these really, you know, goofy music videos out of, you know, uh, angsty teen songs and, uh, dark movies. So that, that was kind of when I, uh, really discovered that I had a, a joy for this. I would, sit, I would sit there for hours and just do it over and over again. Uh, so that's kind of when I discovered I really wanted to do something like this. With yeah. my life, I guess. Yeah, that's good. I, I think the I think the takeaway there is like, it's been a lot of reps for you. You know, you, you, it was just one of these things that you learned by doing it. And, and I read recently that um, passion comes from the Latin pati, which means to suffer. And I think a lot of times, like especially in this culture and the internet and the hype machine, that's like once you find your passion, you will never work a day. And you're all these inspirational quotes, right? But what I love about that story, Kevin, is is it's like it really was like you forged this thing. It wasn't like you just jumped on it was immediately like, oh yeah, this is you know the best thing ever. It was like you made movies and then you made another movies and then you, you found the new software and then you just kind of kept going and really kind of built your passion, right, for, for art and for film. I think that's interesting. The built passion, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I go with Constructed passion. Okay, um, I have a lot of notes here. I have a lot of, uh, I guess, kind of things I could say about the film you guys are working on and the Kickstarter we are, we're all here trying to fund. But uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Hunter. Talk to us about... Day seven. Tell us, tell us your vision. Tell us the story. Uh, tell us what you guys are trying to do. So uh, day seven is goes back right back to suffering. You know, passion. It's uh, a based. It's sort of an offshoot of a film I wrote years and years ago. A feature 
um, where I had been building up this sort of steampunk time travel. What else? Uh, just fantasy. fantasy. Just yeah, like old school fantasy, like ancient fantasy. All of this amalgamation of genres and uh, looks and textures. And uh, it we we worked on it for a long time and worked try, on this you know slog trying to get it made. And uh, what we found was this world is just too massive to try to sell people with words and with a pitch. And so what I thought was, well, let's just take a corner of it, take a snapshot of it, and see what story unfolds there, and a way to introduce these ideas these textures and uh, these visuals of the world. And so Kevin and I got together and uh, we came up with day seven. So day seven is about um, a group of mercenaries that have come together to protect a small tribe of people from a corporation that's coming in to take um, their resources. The resources in this case being these uh, crystals that give off this, um, what did you call it, salve, this healing, this healing solution, um, this magical solution that's really, really uh, priceless. Um, so the mercenaries, it's sort of a seven samurai kind of homage where these, um, uh, mercenaries are standing against the, you know, people coming in, these intruders. Uh, things change a little bit for them when they discover an, uh, a brotherhood of assassins and they're in, out to kind of pick them off and make room for the corporation to come in and, and take the resources. So it's about these characters, uh, really having to come together, but then also having to, deal with this external force that they had not counted on, and each one having its own, their own, uh, each character having their own facet and their own sort of issue that they have to overcome in order to really uh, be successful in this partner, this mercenary partnership. Um, so it takes place in this ancient forgotten forest that uh, this tribe inhabits, and I think it's a, a small scale, cheap, but also really exciting way to introduce audiences to this world and these uh Ideas that are, of course, perpetuated by my love of Star Wars and movies like Star Wars that, that just are excel so much in, in the world building and making you want to just go and, and exist there and see more stories there. So that's the ultimate goal for me, um, besides just the telling of the story. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And it is, it's a live-action film. Uh, you guys are doing, it looks like right at a, a half an hour is what you're trying to put together. Did I read that right? Okay, cool. So, um, and again, I, I love that you're choosing yourself. Actually, is the phrase that kind of keeps coming over to my head. Is like you could you could sit there and have a script all day, or you know, kind of pitch these letters or dream these things in your head and keep them in your rooms. But I, I think for I think it'll be interesting for everyone to hear how you yourself or or you guys are are making that kind of step in the face of fear to say okay we're we're going to make this thing right like we're we're not just going to sit here with a script we're going to try to put it together and actually bring this thing to life how for for those of us who are, are watching at home how do you get there in your mind to say you, you know what this is on me and i'm going to make this happen <laughs> it's kind of a need right it's not something that we i mean yes we desperately want to do but we need to do this like these ideas have been in hunter's brain like pretty much right after I think we met is when we started to like kind of yeah. give birth to these ideas and write things down. And we would hang out and you'd tell me about all these things. It's like, Oh my God. I think that he answered it for me is like the, the ache of failure uh, is eclipsed so much by my ache to make the film. You know, like I sit at night and I, you know, work on it and I just have an actual physical ache that I feel um, when, when I look look ahead and, and look for these images. You know, I'll, I'll look at the TV and sort of superimpose the image there uh, of the film, and it just fills my every limb with just so much energy. And so that's what it is. I have to get it out. Yeah. I have to, at this point, it is um, a poison <laughs> that <laughs> I need to do be it. shared. <laughs> yeah. And I have to get it out just, just to exercise it from myself. You can have it. It's like the ring. You, you take it. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice that's a great description um i'm gonna wrap up here in a second it, before we go um and i'll obviously talk about where people can go to get connected with the film and, and to donate and help fund but is there anything else that any of you guys want to say um before we get out of here um yeah please go to the kickstarter and uh, donate to, to our film Day 7. Uh, I'm sure Todd will make the links available to you. Um, 
again, it is a passion project. Where are these guys, uh, independent filmmakers in Nashville? And uh, and yes, you've named off some some nice credits that I've been a part of, but I <laughs> country music and reality TV can only take you so far in the creativity that we feel like we need to express. And it is in this short film. It is in this these creative endeavors that are ours. It's not me working on somebody else's work to make you know their dreams come true, their music videos or whatever, but this is something of ours that we desperately want to make. And uh, we think everybody, <laughs> we think it's mass marketable. We think everybody will enjoy it. It's very exciting, action-packed, um, these character-driven stories. Um, and day seven is going to be something you haven't seen out of Nashville before. Excellent. 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 Great wrap up. Um, if you guys want to support the film, I'm actually going to make a link. You can go to toddbryson.com slash support day seven, no spaces. And of course I'll link it up below so you can guys can get there easily. Everybody, you guys wave to everybody and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Much love as always. And we'll see you soon.